it would be very nice to have another half hour to respond to the very substantive points made. So I'll just confine myself to a couple of quick remarks in immediate reaction to that. First of all, to say how much I welcome the emphasis which both respondents placed on what you might call the cultural dimension of this legal issue. One can't address issues of rights without addressing what kind of broad cultural environment makes justitia possible or impossible. And I would want, given time, to develop a bit more what the cultural involvements and solidarities might be that would take us forward. That's why I welcome very much what Clifton ended with the question, so what exactly are we going to do about this? And Matt's question about what sort of intermediate social space makes this more than just abstract reflection. So I'm, I'm entirely on board with, with that as a focus. The question which Matt raised about desire comes in there. Do we actually want our citizenship to be genuinely shared with the stranger? Um, in Britain, issues about migrants, their rights and their dignities have been very much on the front pages. Um, I think the appalling disaster last year of the Grenfell Tower fire in London gave us, in a sense, our Black Lives Matter moment. These, these issues are urgent because they've revealed to us how little desire we have for the well-being of the neighbor and the stranger in so many cases. So desire is the word I, I want to hang on to there as a very important element in that response. And it's a question about spirituality at the end of the day, I agree. Um, the whole question of the implication of rights discourse with um, a Eurocentric or Western-centered and essentially racist perspective, that, as I, as I hinted, that's something already at work in John Locke's account, his own complicity in a particular colonial agenda, has to be recognized, uncomfortable as that may be, for the liberal history. But already, of course, at that time, you are beginning to get debates over whether Eus and Justitia do indeed extend beyond the European world. And somebody like Las Casas, in the context of Spanish Latin America, comes to mind there as someone who is not always very successfully, but trying to push the question about universalism. And Roger Ruston's book, which I mentioned, which deals with Locke, has a long and very detailed discussion of Las Casas, which is part of, a, I think, an opening up of the other side of the question, even in that period of colonial history, that it's already beginning to be registered. Um, I think I'd just end by noting that we've been reminded very forcefully of the uncomfortable frontier between rights discourse and power practice. Part of what I was driving at, I think, was a properly conceived, a properly inhabited discourse of rights is going to be one that is always uncomfortable for whatever power settlement exists at any one time. And that the notion that there are things which hegemonic powers cannot lawfully do is in a sense, the key to understanding why this why this matters, why one has to break down um, large narratives about empire, about dominance, about ideological or cultural hegemony, into this question of, so what is actually owed to this person, this person, and this person, this community, this community, this community, the associational liberties which Matt drew our attention to. So, while rights discourse may appear to be a hugely generalizing discourse, it will only work in small particulars. It will only be a reality if we can actually name and confront and wrestle with the specific unlawfulness in justitia that is there in relations of individuals and communities locally and globally much more to say, but thank you very much for these very suggestive responses, and I'll go away and think more about them. <laughs>